Welcome to I Drink Your Podcast, where we drink and talk about movies from 2007. Imagine my little girl, regular. Guys, did you see me dance? No, you wasted energy and time. I turned penis into gold. Are you okay? I want to see you naked. Surprise, dude, you got herpes. If I did, you were a ventriloquist. You're really well dressed for a shadow puppeteer. What is he going to culturally appropriate this time? Mommy. I drink your podcast. I drink it up. Welcome to another episode of I Drink Your Podcast. With me today is Ben. Hey, everybody. Emily. Hello. And Wesley. Hi, everybody. <laughs> nice. And you always forget to introduce, and we have... And our special guest this week is Connor from No Highway Option. Hello. Matt, I was trying to get you to introduce yourself. <laughs> Selfless, selfless. And, uh, and I'm Matt. Whatever, whatever, whatever. He really pulled a mat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he did. <laughs> but I'm interested in uh, uh, Connor, our guest this week, and we are talking and discussing The Simpsons from 2007. So this should be a fun episode. But before we get started, does anyone have anything interesting in their glass? I've got an interesting cocktail I made today. It's called the Simpson and Son Revitalizing Tonic. It is wow. vodka, SoCo, Mountain Dew, and a splash of grenadine. And I called it that because it gets me horny. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I went very straightforward this week. I made a hot chocolate from very much scratch, not just like a powdery mix. I actually had to use milk and cinnamon and vanilla and whatnot. But I made that because Flanders makes... Bart, some hot chocolate. And so I added some Kahlua to it. And I also had a leftover donut. So I used it as a garnish. Oh, very nice. Nice. Did you brulee a marshmallow on top and leave it on a windowsill? I wish I could have done that. <laughs> I tried with some matches. It didn't work. Oh, no. <laughs> In honor of my favorite character from this movie, Harry Plopper, I'm having a nice cuppa, <laughs> which is a cup of tea. But to make it on point for the show, I actually found an Earl Grey tea cocktail recipe. So it's uh, it's Earl Grey tea, gin, honey, lemon juice, and a sprig of lavender. A sprig of lavender. <laughs> I suppose you're all dying to know what's in my gas station cup of soda. It's uh, Dr. Pepper and rum. The reason is it's a gas station soda is because you could find this movie in a gas station bin. Oh. Oof. Ouch. Okay. All right. I also have a gas station cup. Oh, but Ooh. that's exclusively for the reason it has a domed lid on it because of the movie. <laughs> God damn it. My straw fell down <laughs> and it's uh, vodka, triple sec and carrot juice because it's trapped like carrots, like a line from the movie. <laughs> nice. It's <Amazing>. god awful. <laughs> but the message, the message, it's the thought yeah, that counts it's all as they for the say. name. The commitment for a podcast that's not yours is greatly appreciated, Connor. Let's talk to Connor real quick. Uh, Connor, give us an update on No Highway Option. It's been going great. We've been doing a bunch of fun episodes, a bunch of movies that we have never expected to talk about. We actually had Ben on recently to talk about Happy Gilmore, which the two guests we've had from your show, both of them have been 90s sports comedies. That's, that's a <laughs> weird coincidence. <laughs> Just worked out that way. Yeah, and I would like to know the report on your consensus of which movies have passed the pacifier test. Ooh, there have actually, uh, for the Christmas ones, a lot of them ended up passing, like the Santa Claus or Jingle All the Way, I think was mostly even and passed. OK, one that you guys did recently, it should be coming out soon. Walk Hard, the Dewey Cox story passed for all of us, it seems. So so just Woo. to clarify, your show is watching a movie and then deciding whether it's better or worse than the pacifier. Yes, I forgot to mention that. So what does passing the pacifier test mean? Does that mean it's better or worse? It means we think it's better. So usually it's like better, worse or equal. We have a specific set of criteria talking about like the soundtrack. Or is there anything as memorable as a bizarre subplot involving the sound of music? 
<laughs> and it's it's all in good fun. It's all nonsense, but we have a good time with it. Yeah, Connor, I'd like an update. I assigned you guys Surf Ninjas after being on. How was Surf Ninjas? Surf Ninjas was interesting, but it didn't <laughs> hit. It was, I think everybody <laughs> said it was at least slightly worse. Oh, dang. <laughs> Something about Rob Schneider. Rob Schneider, just, yep. All of his voices. Some of them I was like, I can't in good conscience say I enjoyed this part. <laughs> yep, that's fair. Okay, so uh, what made you excited to be on our show for the Simpsons movie, Connor? Well, it was exciting to be invited back, first of all, because I had a great Woo-hoo. time last time. But The Simpsons was a huge thing. I first watched it when I was like 10, and I immediately became obsessed. I was like, this is a grown-up show, but it's also a cartoon, so I can enjoy it while feeling like a grown-up and not being bored. Mm -hmm. And this was like a big pinnacle movie event for me, I would say, because also my favorite band, Green Day, was singing the theme song. So it all it all worked out. (laughs) Nice. And could you give us a little bit of a background in with your your Simpsons fandom? So you started at age 10. So what season would you say that you came in and then maybe went back or what's your experience with the Simpsons? 2005 would be when I was 10. So that was season 16 or so. I started watching it in like the teen seasons that everybody hates and thinks are terrible. (laughs) And I mean, they're kind of right, but like it's a nostalgic thing. And then I went back, watched the old ones with reruns. Now with Disney Plus, I've plowed through the whole thing. And it's still uh, it. I still try to watch it every week just because it's nice. It's like a comforting blanket show. It's like what they say about SNL cast, like everybody's favorite SNL cast is the one you watched when you first started watching SNL. So exactly whether it's good or bad, that that's that's your season. What kind of uh, experience do the rest of us have with The Simpsons? None. Wow. Well, that's not true. I, I remember watching, is it Itchy and Scratchy parts randomly on the TV and then my mom turning it off. Like it was just on one time because we had, it was Channel 21 was Fox. And I still remember because we lived underneath a cliff, it wouldn't always work. And so one time it worked for a little bit. And then my mom saw what was happening. She took the cable away from us. Like literally she <laughs> unplugged it and took it away. So that's my experience with The Simpsons. So I have a similar experience kind of. The Simpsons actually, the first Simpsons on the Tracy Ullman show came out when I was born. So my whole life has been when The Simpsons have existed and they didn't come before me, which is how I like to think about it. But my parents also did not let me watch The Simpsons for a very long time because they thought it was way too adult. But I still remember having a Bart Simpson shirt that was like cyan blue and it was just Bart on the front and it just had a little speech bubble that said, don't have a cow, man. And I remember that was like my favorite (laughs) shirt for multiple years. My experience is a little bit different than your guys. Apparently, my parents were a little more hands off. (laughs) I was... (laughs) I was allowed to watch The Simpsons and uh, it was my favorite cartoon growing up and I watched it on a small box and I would say I was in seasons three through 12, probably stopped watching it a little bit before I went to college. But, you know, I had some of my favorite stuff where like the monorail episode, a lot of the music that happened in the earlier seasons. And, um, you know, Dana Gould is one of my favorite comedians who wrote for The Simpsons for a very long time. So. Yeah, I I had a really great experience with The Simpsons, but I fell off and I haven't seen anything new. And I remember seeing this movie in the theaters and I remember liking it. But on this rewatch, I didn't. So I'm sure we'll get into that. I've got a similar story to you, Matt, where I kind of grew up watching this. My parents um, watched it with me like they would sit. We would sit down and watch it together. Mm. And then after my parents got divorced, that's when I started really seeing a lot of the old episodes because syndication every day 5 to 6 p.m. right during dinner time with my parents we would sit down and eat and watch the simpsons every day on the weekdays so i saw all of those first 12 season episodes a dozen times each uh over the course of years of just eating over dinner similar to you matt after i got into college i kind of stopped watching and then came back for the movie and really enjoyed the movie and i still think the movie is really funny like it still hits me <laughs> in all the right spots so okay we have a plethora of knowledge here. 
Sounds like it. So if you haven't listened to the show before, the first half of our podcast, will be discussing and reviewing the Simpsons movie 2007. In the second half, we'll feature our Battle of Twits, a creative competition featuring our guest Connor taking on Ben, with our current leaderboard being Emily at eight, Wes at six, our guests at one, and me and Ben at zero, with a reward coming at the end of the episode. Mm. Ooh. Okay, so this is The Simpsons movie, directed by David Silverman, featuring the usuals. Dan Castellaneta and all of the people that you know from The Simpsons, you know, Nancy Cartwright, uh, Hank Azaria, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. People of Springfield, heed this warning. Twisted tale, a thousand eyes, trap forever. This book doesn't have any answers. When Green Day drowns in the polluted lake in Springfield, Lisa pushes the mayor in the town to stop throwing crap in the lake. Unfortunately, Grandpa Simpson predicts the end of times for Springfield, but only Marge believes him. Some shenanigans involving pig feces in the lake causes a mutation of a squirrel, which makes the EPA lock down Springfield for good. With a giant glass dome. Like, what the fuck? (laughs) (laughs) I'll tell you what, that pig plot got me in my phone being like, how much manure do pigs produce and what can you do with it? And I learned quite a bit about composting. (laughs) (laughs) Homer added to it, too, so don't credit it all to Spider Pig. He did help. (laughs) (laughs) I have a question about the, the compost. Why would throwing manure into a lake create toxic waste? Like, is that... See, I don't think it had anything to do with the manure. I think it was just that one extra thing that was needed in the lake to cause it to be overly polluted. And it just so happened to be pig manure like that. They didn't want anything else thrown in there. So the fact that the entire silo went in there, Mm -hmm. that just was the tipping point. Yeah. A giant metal figure is also pretty big pollution for a lake. So yeah, Mm -hmm. I'll buy the silo, but the silo of poop, I was like, that's organic. Well, f- feeding pigs can uh, can produce up to 10 pounds of manure per day, Wesley. <laughs> you know, we didn't know what Homer was feeding him the whole time either. So That's true. I, I assume bacon. <laughs> That's a very Homer thing to do. I was going to guess donuts, but yeah, bacon is a very good answer. <laughs> so this movie's kind of interesting in the way it's structured in that it just feels like kind of an elongated Simpsons episode. Yep. Like stretched. So this entire first act is almost like the first seven minutes of introduction to an episode for a Simpsons movie. And it establishes a bunch of different plots right away that are going to be running throughout this movie. Mm -hmm. And it really confused me. Like this whole Flanders is now Bart's dad, but not really like he wants him to be his dad. And then you've got the whole pig thing. And you have Lisa going off with Colin who they're trying to save the environment and save Springfield. And then there's this whole weird thing of religion with grandpa seeing into the future or something through God that everyone's going to be destroyed. So, yeah, I know I can spell this off now, but during the actual movie, I was like, what is actually happening? Why are there so many things happening? Yeah, they're trying to give like each family member their own subplot, except Maggie. She's kind of just a device. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) it like it works kind of for me. Uh, The Lisa thing. I think it's interesting how they start out with a huge environmental message and then it kind of just goes away as soon as the dome comes down. It's like, forget about the environment. That's gone. We're looking at this now. Well, it's and it's not even the environmental message. It's the entirety of Lisa's subplot goes away once that first 35 minutes ends mm-hmm. and she's removed from the dome and from Connor. Like Connor. <laughs> was it it is Connor, isn't it? Colin. Colin, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and then it comes back at the end with a little bit of resolution, but he also has red hair. I understand the confusion. <laughs> yeah, just talking a Scottish or Irish accent, I don't remember. He's from Ireland, but he cares about the environment and plays music, but his dad's not Bono. (laughs) (laughs) Right, right. Oh my God. Yeah, and the screenplay, I noticed, was by everybody. Kind of like the same way they would write an episode. Where they all just sit in the room and try to make each other laugh and then write stuff down? Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. I would feel like this movie could have benefited from having that structure from one screenwriter in like, Having a direction because it does feel like it kind of goes all over the place at the beginning. 
And then once everybody starts to hate Homer for dumping the silo in the lake, that's when it starts to become more of like a bullet train towards where we're going in this film. I found that that manic energy of jumping around, though, like I really enjoyed that because it reminded me again of all of the characters from The Simpsons that I love because it really focuses in that first act on like the broadness of the of the city and the characters like we really get a funny line from just about every character that we know in that first act. Yeah, a lot of I do like how a lot of the supporting characters are able to pop in, say a thing and then pop out. Yeah. I kind of didn't like that. I would have liked them to focus more on like like give Mo more than a couple of lines. Give Chief Wiggum more than a couple of lines cuz it seemed like all these supporting cast members were able to come back and get a line in and get a jab in and I think that it satisfies that fandom, but for me in this film and you you I'm going to have to have you guys jump in because it's been a while since I've actually seen the TV show, but it felt like I didn't like any of the characters like Homer felt like a terrible father. Granted, he is a terrible father in the TV show, but like he's extra unlikable in this film. He doesn't listen to his wife. You know, he's still hitting his kids. I don't remember when they stopped hitting the kids or stop child abuse in The Simpsons. I think they did. He's still strangling him. Okay. Okay. (laughs) I thought they might have, but it's just like the only people I liked the characters were the children, you know, who aren't responsible for that. And like, Watching Bart crave like affection from Ned, like while it was funny getting the pat on the back, it was kind of heartbreaking. And I also like Flanders, but everyone else, I was just like, I was hating each character and it might be on me there, but um, I felt like maybe if they focused on more the subplot, then we'd have more cohesion there. There's a thing that a lot of Simpsons fans like to refer as like during these seasons and a little earlier after the golden age, they think Homer turned into what they call jerk ass Homer, where he be, he goes from being like a bit of a bumbling oaf kind of immature to just like awful and full of hate and full of spite. And I feel like this movie, he begins with that, especially with the I'm going to force my son to skateboard naked which we didn't we didn't need the dick shot, but whatever. Can I say that <laughs> actually made me laugh, that gag? <laughs> oh, of oh, it covering up his penis the whole time? Yeah. Yeah, that made me chuckle. And then it's just a quick reveal. But I feel like towards the end of this, it's them trying to get out of jerk-ass Homer. And like in the recent seasons, he's kind of just gone back to being a little more of a lovable doof. Mm -hmm. So I think it's I think it's interesting to see them trying to get out of that. Yeah. At the end, uh, he wins back Marge. But I felt like all that was unearned because, you know, I think the monkey hitting the symbols together, like he's ignoring her about the pig silo. And then the monkey puts his symbols down and points at Marge, like, pay attention to your wife. Like, I was just like, Homer is not lovable at all. And I always remembered him as this lovable idiot, you know, that had radioactive material in his back. He would be stupid and he would put his family in danger, but through his own stupidity versus like, you know, I'm going to dare my son to fucking skateboard naked or just actively endanger my family on purpose. I'm, I'm having trouble putting words to why I disagree with you. I don't think that the main plot or any of these plots weren't fleshed out enough. And I think that streamlining it to less of them would this movie was only 80 five minutes long. So I think that a lot of this was filler, but I I think the fan service that you alluded to, I think is very important. This is the Simpsons movie. This isn't an episode. This is the time to get everyone in the city involved. And I think giving everyone at least something decent and entertaining versus letting, you know, who's, who's to say Mo should be the one that gets six minutes of airtime versus Mrs. Krabappel, just getting that 10 seconds of lifting up her shirt at the green day concert. And I think that fan service piece is something that we need to remember. Like this movie was clearly not made for people who were not already fans of The Simpsons. Mm -hmm. That's true. It literally just drops us in this pre-established universe. This is not like the South Park movie, which kind of does the legwork at the beginning of introducing the characters if you've never met them before. Like that's why the South Park movie works for people who have never seen South Park. And that's partly because this movie came out 18 years into its run. Whereas the South Park mm-hmm. movie came out two years into its run and it was its run was on cable and it was getting like two million people a week. That was really only two years in? Yeah. Wow. 
Trey and Matt are geniuses. I had a professor in college who said it's the best movie musical of the 90s, hands down. It and is. I kind of agree it with is. this. The music is amazing. I was reading this movie was supposed to be a musical originally, but then they kept cutting things out. And so as they were all spitballing to try to put together an idea, they kind of went with Matt's. And as they were putting it into production and actually animating and going through all the voice acting, they started cutting stuff out. There are lots of cameos that got cut because it was just too convoluted. And so they were trying to streamline things, but I still found, I guess that was just the first act. It wasn't enough for me because I had really never seen a Simpsons movie. So I completely agree. You know, I'm thinking back to Futurama, which I love and their movies. And it felt the same way for me as like a fan of Futurama. I know the characters, I know what's happening. And then it jumps into the movies as like a season, you know? And so I guess it does make sense to me why they did it the way that they did. And I will say I didn't completely hate this movie. Like, uh, it, like a lot of these opening gags landed for me, you know, like I will not illegally download this movie, Bart writing on the chalkboard. And I was just like, that's funny. And, uh, <laughs> you know, some of the like the winking at you, like they're like, yes, we're advertising for our television show in the movie. Like I was like, oh, this is this is pretty funny. Like I could imagine being annoyed if I saw this in the movie theater. But at the same time, you know, like this is a comedy and it deserves that type of humor in it, you know, so. Mm hmm. And the call out of us fans watching it in the theater when we get it for free on TV as being suckers, like right off the bat, that that worked for me as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that gets you right into the tone of it. So much of those gags didn't work for me. I don't know. Like, maybe it's because I just haven't seen a lot of Simpsons. And I've been curious for sure, especially with a few YouTube videos just talking about the rise and fall of the Simpsons, a little bit more about the creativity and the nuances that are involved in it. And so I've been watching a lot of that kind of thing. And I'm like, oh, I'm actually interested in this. But the only two times I laughed were when there was the gag with Bart being naked skateboarding. And then also when Homer hits his eye with a hammer. I don't know why, but those oh were the God. only two, two times <laughs> that I laughed. So Emily, you said that a lot of this didn't land for you, but I think, and I want to introduce a new term. Maybe it's not new, but I'm going to claim it if it isn't. Comfort comedy. Well, yeah, I think that's what Connor said earlier, right? It's very much like a lot of the jokes are similar to what they do on the show. And like you can see with the screenplays being like half of the showrunners from the golden era or whatever that like you can feel it a little bit, but it feels modern. It's a weird mix, but it's laughing at the jokes because it's like, yeah, I know I remember laughing at something like this. Sorry to steal that from you. Wes. No, 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 not at all. It was perfect. I guess my follow up to Emily then was. Did they not land to the point where you scoffed or were in disgust of the jokes or they just didn't make you laugh out loud? Uh, there were a few moments where I kind of rolled my eyes and went, wow, really? You wrote this? This is that's what the best you could do. OK, mm -hmm. I would say there were a lot of moments where I did not laugh out loud. And like I completely get how Simpsons has transformed comedy for today, especially with all of the incredible adult animation stuff out there rick and morty bob's burgers archer like there's so many things out there and it really started with the simpsons and then south park and you know it's just a cascade of wonderful things that i love so watching this and hearing the jokes i'm so used to bursting out in laughter so maybe i need to reflect on that a little bit more but i didn't find a lot of the jokes to be that same sort of Emily's laughing out loud. <laughs> I think that's that's kind of how I rewatch this. And I, I think that's kind of my feeling towards The Simpsons in general. Like, I, I love it. And that's why I was kind of thinking of like a comfort comedy where Simpsons normally doesn't make me laugh out loud. Like, they're not things that make tears come out my face because it's so funny. But I also think to to your point of Simpsons really being one of the innovators of so much of this. It's kind of like when you go back and watch an old sci fi movie that was incredibly innovative at the time and had crazy CGI or some brilliant twist at the time. And I don't know if that's something you can even teach yourself to do is kind of like learn to appreciate the fact that it was innovative at the time. I would totally agree with you. There's a lot of comfort comedy in this. Uh, an example would be, you know, the mob's coming for Homer, you know, and then they're like, 
no, we just want Homer when they're having that discussion or like, <laughs> yeah. they're like grandpa. And he's like, I'm part of the mob, you know, like not necessarily <laughs> laugh out loud funny, but that makes you laugh. But I also feel like this movie suffered from the time period it was in as well. 2007, you know, you have one of the jokes just being Homer fingers crossed, hoping Flanders is gay. You know, he's going to announce that he's gay and you're just like, okay, you know, you tap your, your, your leg there and you're like, okay, hopefully that'll be something that, I can, I don't, I don't want to say overlook, but like, you know, like hopefully there's not a lot of that in there, you know? And, uh, I, I would agree though. Like there was a lot of comfort comedy in here and a lot of great gags. So I don't want you guys thinking I completely hated it. I just felt like a lot of the, he hated it. I feel like, I feel exactly like what Connor, Connor was saying about like Homer being a jerk dad. One thing that I did not take comfort in with this movie, and it's because it looks different from the ones I used to watch is the animation style in this movie and Connor, maybe you can speak to like when this type of more depth animation was being used in Simpsons. It seems like this is around when they did the shift to HD. I want to say that was in like between 2008 and 2010, but even with the show in HD, it doesn't look like this, this they like, it seems like they did a lot of the backgrounds, but then did bigger outlines on the characters to make them pop. And it, mm-hmm. there is some weird stuff with the shading and like just how they look. Yes. There's a few moments where their tongues look weird. I don't know why I've <laughs> always fixated on that. <laughs> Since I first saw it in theaters, I remember just like they scream at one point. And I'm like, that's not his tongue color. I don't know why <laughs> I fixate on that so much, but it still bothers me to this day. <laughs> yeah, you brought up the shading on the characters. And that's the thing that really threw me off in this one, because the shading wasn't based on a light source. It was just any time their back was shown, their back was shaded. So the edge of their back is always shaded a darker color as if a light is being like front cast on their bodies. Yeah, like a real like a real movie production. Yeah. No, no, (laughs) no. I get what Ben's saying. The light source doesn't match the shading and like that's what's motivating shading. So if it doesn't make sense Mm -hmm. with the light source, it's like your brain subconsciously tells you that. I'm sure Ben didn't come up with that immediately and he had to reflect on that like afterwards like why did the shading bother me for me it was a lot of the 3d motion in the 3d animation where we're going through the crowd shots we've never seen in the show before Mm -hmm. which was like kudos for trying to reimagine the the show but it just didn't work no i need to know what i'm approving absolutely but on the other hand knowing things is overrated Anyone can pick something when they know what it is. It takes real leadership to pick something you're clueless about. Okay, I picked three. Try again. One. Go higher. Five. Too high. Three. You already said three. Six. There is no six. Two. Double it. Four. As you wish, sir. The town discovers Homer's pig feces silo in the lake and goes on a rampage to kill him. The family barely escapes through the sinkhole and travels to Alaska to start over. After they settle in, Marge sees Tom Hanks advertising the new Grand Canyon right where Springfield is. She puts the pieces together that the EPA is planning on destroying the town, so she takes the kids back to warn everyone before it's too late. This ludicrous plot gets more insane, and they have Arnold Schwarzenegger as the president who randomly is selecting the plans, and Tom Hanks is a cameo. I just... I don't know. I It really was just so dumb. <laughs> I liked it. The Schwarzenegger thing really bothered me because within The Simpsons, there's already an established Schwarzenegger character in the form of Rainier Wolfcastle. Mm-hmm. So I feel like it would have made more sense to have him be president. And it's the same design. They just gave him different Correct. colored hair. Same design, oh, same really? voice. Like it's Rainier Wolfcastle. That's also always bothered me. I I think the Tom Hanks section is my favorite part of the movie. I don't know why. So good. Tussle, tussle my hair. And he, he like makes a little noise when he tussles the kid's hair. It's not where anything was or ever will be. <laughs> and that was actually Tom Hanks, right? Yep. Yes. Oh Tom God, Hanks as him. himself. And can I tell you the two bits or let's go three bits that worked for me is the uh, Bart drawing over the wanted poster, like the handlebar mustache <laughs> and the, the other family. And then they turn around as they're driving away and that family is getting arrested. (laughs) It's like they're real people. And then when he's in Alaska, there's a bar named uh, Eskimos. Oh, yeah. Where where he plays Grand Theft Walrus. Did I miss this movie or something? I don't remember that. (laughs) (laughs) 
And then the last one was Bart clapping for the avalanche. He's like, no, you clap for Alaska to Lisa. And then they both start <laughs> clapping. All of those worked for me, for sure. I do you think now looking back now that Disney owns The Simpsons and like I watched this on Disney Plus, it is strange to watch The Simpsons do Disney parodies to me because they're like, haha, oh, look they at make these fun guys. Of them, right? That evil mouse corporation. Well, yeah, first they have like the deer coming in and like doing the Snow White thing to get them ready to bang. And then, yeah, later Bart drops down. And as Mickey Mouse says, I'm the mascot of, e- of an evil corporation. I'm like, that's your home now. <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's it's very strange to like this is the world we live in now. Yeah, I think, Emily, you alluded to it in what you've missed. But I think one of my favorite things in this movie, The Simpsons really was one of the first or at least the first for me to do a lot of tropes. So like we were just saying, the a bar called Eskimos, it's not said out loud. You have to read it. Grand Theft Walrus, again, is is not said. Grandpa in the in the first act is reading a magazine called Oatmeal Enthusiast. That's very funny. <laughs> There's just a lot of those passive things that I think started to get really popular with shows like Bob's Burgers and BoJack Horseman, which BoJack Horseman, I think, has done it better than anybody I've ever seen. But like skewing that like background information that you're not expected to pay attention to. But when you start noticing it, it, it makes it so much richer and funnier as a whole, even though it's not the joke or even having anything to do with the story. We were talking about earlier with the environmental angle. I thought they did a good job of working that back in when they travel to Alaska and they hand Homer a thousand dollars in cash. <laughs> and they're like, oh, this is because we ravaged the natural beauty of Alaska for, for our for our oil. And I thought that was a decent angle. And I wanted to make sure we mentioned that. Well, that's very true to what you actually get for living in Alaska. Like you do get a a government Mm -hmm. stipend for living in Alaska. So, right. I love Homer's reaction to that, too, where he gets handed a thousand dollars. He goes, finally. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I will say something I find really clever about what I've seen so far of The Simpsons is that there's a lot of payoff. I think, is it Chekhov's gun? Mm -hmm. You know, you see him on the motorcycle in the cage and trying to get up and around and Lisa helping him. I did like that as a going through and talking about the story of this movie. I didn't like a lot of the movie, but I thought the second second act at least gave me some sort of motivation and plot versus the first part of the movie. I was confused and overwhelmed by all the different pieces that were moving. <laughs> and so the second chunk of it, it felt like it had the most meat. That's kind of how most of the episodes are structured. Oh, really? Cool. They're structured like the first act is they go to a museum and you're like, okay, how's this episode going to be about a museum? But in the museum, they meet some celebrity guest and then that makes the second and third act plot actually happen. Yep. So it's it's structured very similarly to an episode, but with just a lot more. It's almost like a misdirect in that first first act. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and that is how a lot of those other shows that kind of are copycats of The Simpsons also function. Like if you watch Family Guy, the first seven minutes of a Family Guy episode really have no bearing on what the rest of the plot's going to be. Mm-hmm. And then right at the end of that first act of the episode, you get a brief introduction to where the rest of the episode's going. Um, and I, I think that second act and third act of The Simpsons movie wouldn't work without the foundations laid in that first act. Okay. It kind of like gives you kind of like what we're talking about with this movie too it it gives you the world and then it it narrows down your focus and says here's what we're looking Mm -hmm. at today Mm -hmm. and then i think some of the best episodes and this is is more than just the simpsons uh but other other entertainment shows that that do this type of thing but the the best ones somehow bring you back to that first act even after the second and third act wrap up that narrower picture those are i don't have any specific examples but i i know that that happens quite frequently where it's like I have no idea where this is going. Oh, we're going a different direction. Okay, now I see how it related to the first thing. Let's talk about our celebrity cameos and portrayals in this movie. So we have Green Day right off the bat. We have Tom Hanks. Who else was in this? He's not a celebrity cameo, but Albert Brooks is playing Russ Cargill, head of the EPA. Oh, right. And I think he's great in it. The only reason I brought that up is because I liked how... Uh, We talked a little bit about South Park earlier, but I like how South Park ran their cameo 
uh, with like, you know, they have George Clooney playing a barking dog. Right. It's like it shows you how or Simpsons is the original. And then you see how creative people could be after and um, kind of paving the way for everything to come. Yeah, but at the same time, South Park doesn't pull in the cameos that The Simpsons does because The Simpsons actually utilizes the people in an effective way. Like they come on and they serve a point. Whereas South Park, they tried to get Jerry Seinfeld on in that first season. And they're like, we want you to play turkey number three and just gobble, <laughs> gobble. And Jerry Seinfeld's like, no, that, I'm, I'm fucking Jerry Seinfeld. Like, I'm not going to be a turkey. So I, I think that's the difference between South Park and The Simpsons is The Simpsons actually like, wants to capitalize on the celebrity and the South Park guys just want to be like, fuck your celebrity. I don't need that. Well, I think they, they also treat celebrities very differently, whereas Simpsons treat them even in their characters as celebrities. But in South Park, most of it is just making fun of the celebrities, whether it's making them do ridiculous things or not. But like the Barbara Streisand monster, they just destroy celebrities. <laughs> yeah, they're like, uh, we've got it. We've I think we have a better <laughs> handle on your celebrity than you do. <laughs> no, I can't do it. I want a father who's the same in the morning as he is at night. Oh, what's that word? Consistency! Thanks, losers. Sorry, Homer. I'll let you hold the bone. The man knows me. <laughs> Homer realizes his mistake of not going back to help and leaves his new home in Alaska. On arriving back in Springfield, he realizes the EPA has kidnapped his family, so he tries to save them by climbing up the glass bubble. Meanwhile, the town folk are not accepting their fate of being blown up, so they try to escape. Although Homer thwarts their plans, eventually Homer uses the motorcycle to get the bomb to the hole at the top with Bart and they shatter the dome, saving Springfield. Which I still, the glass raining down on everyone. I did appreciate someone saying, yeah, no one got hurt. <laughs> I did <laughs> no, really appreciate did that. Die. Dr. Nick. Someone died? Yeah, Dr. Nick died. Did he die in canon then? No, I think he's still in the show sometimes. I love Dr. Nick. Hi, everybody. So I know this is a cartoon and I shouldn't get hung up on the physics of it. But he was so stupid. It was so stupid. That motorcycle, like the speed that you would need to get to go around the fucking bubble. Like, there's just no way. I mean, even before that, he climbs up the side of a sheer glass dome with crazy glue on his hands. <laughs> Did anyone else feel like the glass dome would just overheat everyone and they would just be like ants and just get fried? Because that's what I thought. Yeah, they was literally happen. said that they don't have fresh air or wind. Yeah. yeah, you would have thought there would have been a magnifying effect or greenhouse effect. All of the science things just did not make sense to me. <laughs> now, this came out the same year, I think, as a Stephen King book with the exact same plot. And I'm. I don't know if anyone's read that, but I'm wondering if it goes into more of that type of disaster stuff. You're talking about Under the Dome. Under the Dome, yes. They I have not read Under the Dome. I've read other stories that take place inside of a dome, like the Gone book series, which is a young adult series about a bunch of kids who all live inside of a dome. However, the dome is supernatural, so it doesn't, it doesn't affect that. I don't know about Under the Dome, whether it's a supernatural thing or an actual glass dome. The best dome story i think we can all agree on is biodome <laughs> <laughs> i was gonna say mad max thunderdome oh yes. or beyond thunderdome excuse me i was gonna say little big league which takes place in the metrodome <laughs> <laughs> r.i.p that's that's another destroyed dome that's the one that you're in right ben that's the one that i'm in yeah <laughs> i do have a brief appearance in little big league as child in yellow shirt in crowd <laughs> 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 Speaking of this relating to other movies that came out this year, when the dome does start to shatter and Homer and Bart start to fall down to the ground, did anybody else relate that to Spider-Man 3 jumping between broken cement blocks and things as he was spider slinging to to catch? Well, now I am. I was going to say, now Wesley. that you mentioned it. As soon as I saw that, I was like, this is just like Spider-Man, Spider-Ham. They were in collusion. <laughs> that's they do the joke with that twice with the spider pig and then he's harry plopper which like both as everyone who listens to this should know big 2007 movies i wish they did one more with the pig name i don't know yeah. what it would have been pig a i don't know there you go <laughs> pork to miss prime 
<laughs> there we <laughs> go. <laughs> there will be bacon. <laughs> I love the added bonus of the credits as well. They had a spider pig song uh, where they sang spider pig. And I felt like it was kind of funny to see, you know, enter the spider verse that there was a spider pig Mm -hmm. (laughs) that would would eventually come played by John Mulaney. Speaking of that song, Hans Zimmer wrote that and did (laughs) all the music for this. I mean, I didn't know Danny Elfman. It makes sense. Danny Elfman did the main theme, but Hans Zimmer was asked to do the music. And I'm going, wait, what? (laughs) You're doing the music for the Simpsons movie? And I I did actually enjoy it. They had a lot of really cool themes that weren't just the Simpsons theme. And it was Mm -hmm. really nicely put together. But like that just blew my mind when he, I read somewhere that he put together a choral arrangement of Spider Pig and how fucking hilarious that was for him. <laughs> <laughs> and just so you know, Emily, it's it, Hans Zimmer is basically he's got a factory um, set up. He does, you know, in a year, in a single year, he'll score maybe like 100 movies. Like I might be exaggerating there, but he has a team of composers that work for him and he might be more of like you know, the CEO of Hans Zimmer. So when you see something scored by Hans Zimmer, he might not have even actually wrote it, but just signed off on it or tweaked it. Or So he's the DJ Khaled of movie scores? <laughs> yeah. Basically, I, yeah. I, oh, but, my God. And that's why in every Hans Zimmer score, you've got Hans Zimmer. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm not trying to discredit him or anything like that either, but like he he's very good at what he does and he knows his musical theory and stuff, but in order to do that many, you have to have a team working for you and you have to be good at making a lot of decisions. I'm going to have to do some research because your fabricated number of 100 a year just makes me completely confused. Yeah, come back and correct me. But it is a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> OK. Sometimes it's easy. Like a, a squirrel just fall into his lap like. <laughs> <laughs> OK, just to bring us back to this movie, there was one part in this kind of ending chunk that really did bother me. And that was the Inuit woman and all of the things that were happening with Homer trying to do this throat singing to realize that he needed to go back to save his family and save his town. And wow, was that in bad taste in my opinion. And I, I'm sure that they didn't really think about it back then. And now just, it did not age well. But even then, looking back on it, I'm like, geez, they just did a real shit job of this. Did Matt's blah impression make you remind you of the throat singing? No, it was just something that I was like, I need to talk about this before I forget. (laughs) Well, and the thing about that part is that it's very similar to an episode that they already did. So it's, it's like they're already like stealing from themselves. So like that Simpsons did it idea, like Simpsons, you already did this. With I'm thinking of the episode where with the, the coyote. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the peyote yeah, the, coyote. Something about like mysterious journey, but in Spanish. Yes. But after he eats all the chili, the, the, mm-hmm. the, the chili peppers. <laughs> but yeah, it just reminded me of something they'd already done. So I, I didn't really like that part either, Emily, but for different reasons, clearly than you. It's kind of a necessary part. Like it's just them doing visually fun things that they wouldn't get to do in the show. But he was already on his way back to Springfield. Right. They could have done just like a hypothermia dream sequence of some sort. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree. It could have been done in better taste, but the same type of sequence. Right. He was already on his way back to Springfield. But as we've hinted at, Homer is not the brightest and and maybe doesn't have the purest intention. So I think this was an attempt to make his reason for going back less about missing his family and being lonely and and more about like actually understanding what he had done wrong or how he needs to to fix it so again not not the best like there were i'm sure were better ways to do this but i think that there was at least a point for the why it happened <laughs> i would have liked to see him just come to a realization after like reading a billboard or something like something <laughs> just stupid where like he comes to this grand realization from something so mundane and silly like it's on a it's on a beer tab or something that would have worked like love your family is that more his character absolutely but, yeah yes. that feels oh, yeah. very simpsons if we're done talking about the movie let's talk about what happened after the movie something happened after the movie there were like six post credit scenes so how many of you stopped once the credits started rolling? I did. I 
stopped after three of them, I think, but I don't remember any of them. I was going to say, I remember the little gags in the theater, like walking out and hearing something and like running back in and being like, wait, there's more. (laughs) I watched the first two and then had to go to the bathroom and I was like, there's no way there's going to be more. So I just left it play. And then like two more happened while I was like going to the bathroom and coming back. So I'm not even sure what all of them were, but two of them that I did see that I thought were were kind of funny. I believe it's the first one, but it's just Mr. Burns and Smithers sitting there. And Mr. Burns is talking to Smithers and goes, you know, I don't believe in suicide, but if you want to, it might cheer me up. Yep, I do remember that <laughs> yep. one. It's like, whoa. <laughs> yep. And then the other one, which was, uh, I'll let you just be the judge, but it is the Simpsons family watching the credits roll in a theater. And they all stand up and start to walk out. And there's some other commentary, but Lisa wants to stay to make sure that no animals were harmed. And then it rolls in the credits and they're like, okay, cool. And then they start to walk out and Maggie looks like she has something to say. So they're like, Maggie, what do you you have something to say? And she she pulls out her pacifier, looks straight into the camera and goes, sequel? Oh, geez. Yeah, real grab there. She's supposed to say anything? She speaks in one episode and says, dada. In the ones before that, sometimes, like, I remember there was one where they were like, yeah, she's going to do a big speech and she's voiced by Jodie Foster, but, like, only babies can understand her. Ha ha ha. It wasn't good. <laughs> that was another gag at the end where uh, Bart is talking to his dog. He's like, oh, I can't believe you survived. And then the dog has the lower third that says, like, I had to do so many unspeakable things. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll never be the same again. And he's like, you made it. I love you, boy. <laughs> it's so fun. One of the few times I almost laughed out loud. <laughs> <laughs> there is also one post credit scene that's two seconds long, but it's Tom Hanks directly addressing the camera and saying, if you see me in real life, leave me alone. <laughs> oh, yes, I do remember that one. That was funny. That's I think that's when I turned it off. <laughs> so, Wesley, you brought up a sequel. Has there been talks of doing a second Simpsons movie? I don't know. Connor, would you happen to know? It's always like in the ether, apparently, but there have been multiple times in the show where... Somehow the plot will be like, Lisa makes a documentary and they take it to Sundance. And she's like, I can make another documentary. And Marge says, no more Simpson movies. Or like, they always are like, it's not going to happen. If it does, it'll be like for a while. Okay. With how cartoon shows go now, especially South Park is, is one of the biggest ones. But how they've started doing serialized shows where it's not a 25 minute episode anymore that doesn't really it's disjointed from the rest of the series but now essentially a season of uh south park is two or three movies just broken into 30 minute parts but if you were to watch it back to back you're basically watching a south park three movies every season so i also think that and i don't know if the simpsons has done that but i think that that's an interesting way to avoid the big blockbuster and still make these epic stories if that's what you want to do Yeah, I think that would really work. A serialized uh, Homer maybe uh, getting marriage counseling and learning not to hit his kids and stuff like that. That'd be be sick. (laughs) What? He's done marriage counseling. Simpsons did it. A lot. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, you even saying that right now, like one of my favorite parts was a Simpsons did it. And it's just the Monty Burns, you know, the release the hounds gag. That was like that comfort humor that I love. So maybe they could do it again. I don't give a shit. Maybe it would. Stick a little bit more. I don't know. Wesley. Yeah. You got any uh, observations? No, No, I'm just kidding. These are just a few of our incredible thoughts. You know how they say actors need to have a secret that nobody else knows but them when they play a character? No. Is that true? Nobody's ever heard that before? No. (laughs) I have now. So as a character, you're supposed to have a secret that the audience doesn't know, but you know. And I like to think that John Mulaney's Spider-Ham knows that he is Harry Plopper from this movie. And it, yeah, that made me laugh. Also in this movie has a very iconic meme, which is Bart saying, this is the worst day ever. And Homer leaning down to reassure him and says, this is the, <laughs> the worst day of your life so far, which in 2020 became a very popular meme of this is the worst year yet. This is the worst year yet so far. And so that was very enjoyable to 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 see that the source material. But my absolute favorite part of this movie that actually made me laugh the most was when Homer and, and the pig are bonding and they're watching TV together. <laughs> and he see, 
they see a kiss and Homer's like, ah, oh, just laughing about it. And he turns to the pig and goes, maybe we should kiss just to break the tension. <laughs> <laughs> and then Marge walks in and says like, what's going on? Ben, did they say? Say my name. They did say it, and they said it very early on. Um, so th- at the beginning of most Simpsons episodes, it does that little uh, like heavenly music, and it's like, the Simpsons. And then Professor Frank flies by in this one with a little banner flying behind him, and he says, movie on the big screen. <laughs> and every time I watch an episode of The Simpsons now, I do that Professor Frank line just because it, it's, it's just so funny to me. <laughs> <laughs> Emily, is there math in this movie? I did some math. Oh, oh we oh, got to post the notes. So get off your ass, let's do some math. Math, 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 math. So just a little background. This show has a ton of math enthusiasts that are the creators of this show. And it's similar to Futurama in the sense that you'll find a lot of random math things in the background of everything. And it is just insane. Now, I'm not going to talk about any of those because I didn't want to. I came up with my own problem. So I wanted to find out how large this dome actually had to be to encompass all of Springfield. So using some geometry and some estimation tools of mine, I was like, okay, Springfield's about 30,000 people. If we figure out like a normal size of a 30,000 population town... It's going to be about 8.38 square miles. And then I did some really cool hypotenuse work using Pythagorean theorem to figure out my radius (laughs) of the sphere. And then I had to cut it in half. And I ended up getting that this dome had to be 436.74 cubed miles, which I'm like, okay, this in context means nothing to me. So let's figure out how many donuts would fit the whole space. (laughs) So using the donut that I had, I actually measured it, the outside radius, the inside radius, and I measured it to figure out the volume in cubic inches, and then I converted. And basically what I got is that there would be 1.25 quadrillion donuts inside that dome. How many donut holes? The same amount, because each donut has one hole. <laughs> There's always one in each class, huh, Emily? <laughs> Emily, your segment today brought two things to my mind. The first one is the, the Simpsons writers and their love of math. It's shocking the number of Simpsons writers that went to Harvard. I know. So I, wa- I wonder how many of them just have math backgrounds that are just like, oh, we also write as like a fun side gig. No, there are multiple books out there talking about and interviews with the creators and where they purposely put in math because that's where they went to school for that. Like one of them was 16 years old and went to Harvard to study math. What? (laughs) The other thing is that when this dome comes down, one thing that bothered me is that the dome coming down completely changes the geography of the city to make it so that the Simpsons are on the outside of the dome. I could have sworn that they've shown before that there are neighbors to the back of the Simpsons, Mm. not a wide open forest. Yeah, and it's also for the gags, because there's one gag where the people run out of the church and into Moe's, and they're next door to each other, and the sign at Moe's says Moe's Bar instead of just Moe's, but that's that's some comic book guy nonsense. (laughs) And then the dome coming down on the seesaw that has Martin on it that flings him, like all of a sudden the school is right on the edge of a forest also. Took me completely took out me of right it. Took me right out of it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this movie's not realistic at all. Yeah. <laughs> I can take magic sinkholes, but moving places. <laughs> so, Connor, you got a review for us? Yeah. So, while the Simpsons movie doesn't have the cleverness of the show's golden age, no matter how many references to it it puts in it, it's a fun time that might remind someone who stopped watching the show why they liked it in the first place. Kind of beats the TV show turned into movie curse by feeling cinematic. And not just like projecting an episode on a larger screen. I gave it eight and a half epiphatries out of 11. (laughs) Nice. Very nice. Wait, you said out of 11? Yeah, I was going to ask. I do not understand the 11 reference. Oh, that's just a number. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Emily, you should have got that one. It was a number. (laughs) 
And now it's time to play Battle of the Simps. <laughs> Sun movie Battle of Twits creative competition. I will pose three donut rounds of questions to our yellow bodied competitors and see if they can come up with a better solution than Cletus running into a cement wall over and over again. The winner of each donut round will get one steamed ham. Second place gets zero fatherly love. I will be more easily persuaded by the creative and entertaining answers. So, Twits, are you ready? Yeah. Yes, I am. Before we start question one, I need Connor. I need for you to give Ben a Simpsons character. All right, Ben, for you, you get Superintendent Gary Chalmers. Nice. I'm so glad I made a steamed ham joke then. Yeah. <laughs> With the character that your opponent just gave you, I want you to give them the Bleeding Gums Murphy treatment, the old Mod Flanders spin, the classic Frank Grimes maneuver. Basically, how are you going to kill off your character in an upcoming episode? And while Ben writes, Connor, why don't you tell us, uh, have you been watching anything new recently? Um, I've actually, I'm going to look at 2021 as a year to watch a lot of the iconic shows that I was either too young for or just never got into. So I started with The West Wing last night. Oh, very nice. Oh, nice. And it's I enjoy it. It's fun, it seems. It's weird seeing um, Rob Lowe like that young. I, I don't know. In my head, he's always like a lot older than that. But he doesn't look that much older, at least compared to everybody else. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I could do a political drama right now either. That's a good point. I mean, it's it's got like the Aaron Sorkinisms enough that like it's taking place in its own little world it feels like that has a strong cast alice and janney the other people the other people <laughs> mr sheen martin sheen bradley whitford whitford bradley whitford that's the one i was going for yeah yeah i know my my parents used to watch that all the time but i was never not a big politics guy so never seen it connor what else is on your list uh just on the list i mean breaking bad i binged with friends in college but it would always be like a someone sitting down watches a little someone leaves so that's definitely up there the sopranos my sister is obsessed with so every couple months she's like have you watched it yet <laughs> <laughs> i've heard really good things about it yeah just like i i want to and like they have their prequel movie coming out in march but like give me some time yeah that's a that's a, that's a good start to the list but i think that's enough time for ben oh okay it's not <laughs> how are you going to kill off superintendent chalmers okay so superintendent chalmers uh for those who don't know is principal skinner's boss the head of the schools of springfield so during his quarterly inspection of the school he will be walked and guided by principal skinner and martin prince because you always bring along your best student to do the tours that's why emily got to do all the tours in her high school she was valedictorian i don't know if you guys knew that oh i just God. found that out so that was <laughs> <Wow>. pretty cool <laughs> but as they're being guided along superintendent chalmers notices all of these things that are broken because it's a public school shit's broken everywhere as a teacher i can tell you that for certain <laughs> <laughs> so as he's inspecting the classroom of miss hoover he goes to look at the tv that is mounted in the corner and kind of Checks on it. It's still one of those big box TVs because, again, public school, they can't afford a flat screen. He goes <laughs> to check on it and it crushes him and lands right on him. And as he's dying, the last things he shouts is Skinner! And then kind of <laughs> life leaves his body and we hear Ralph say, oh no, the Super Nintendo died. <laughs> and that is that is his death scene. And then he's replaced by um, Nintendo 64. <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> all right then connor ben what is who is connor working with so connor i feel like the simpsons need to copy a different show so this time it's going to be family guy did it so i'm going to have you kill santa's little helper oh no oh, no <laughs> oh the dog i was like what are you talking about the dog. okay all right well while connor writes emily i hear that you've been up to some watching stuff yeah, I've been getting into a little bit of some thriller horror. Dylan would be so proud of me. First off, I watched Silence of the Lambs for the first time, and I loved it. Whoa. I've also been watching the show Hannibal with my husband, and so that's been really fun. Mads. But last night, 
I watched Happy Death Day, which was hilariously wonderful, and I fucking loved it. That's one of my favorite franchises. It's so (laughs) great. It's this never-ending Groundhog Day loop of this girl constantly getting murdered, and she's just like a shit person at a college and she's in this sorority and she's just a bitch and it's wonderful. She's a great protagonist. I really enjoyed not only her growth as a person, the more and more that she died, but also just the humor in it, the ways that she was dying. Yes, there were parts that were a little scary for me, but most of the time it was just funny and I'm excited to watch the second one. Has anyone else seen it no. besides Connor? Yep. I haven't seen it. It sounds a little bit like Palm Springs. It is. Yeah. That it's kind of from idea. 2017, I think. It's a good horror movie for those who don't like horror movies, kind of like Cabin in the Woods. Okay. So Dylan wouldn't be proud of me then. <laughs> no, he'd be proud of you. Definitely. Dylan's proud of all of us always. Yeah. It's, it's one of his biggest downfalls. <laughs> <laughs> Connor. How are you going to canonically kill off a dog? (laughs) So I will say right before I went halfway through, I was going to have him get hit by a car, but I was like, that's exactly what Family Guy did. So I'm not (laughs) doing that. (laughs) So in this episode, Homer would get fed up with big candy becoming too expensive and not giving him the flavor combinations he craves. So out of his basement, he starts his very own chocolate factory. And he, unfortunately, nobody's home, so he decides the best person to test the chocolate, besides himself, would be Santa's little helper. And if he likes chocolate, the dog should love it, right? Right. And it's a tragedy. Oh my god. (laughs) (sighs) Sorry. Oh, that hits me really deep because one of my sister's dogs had a seizure from chocolate and died. Oh no, I'm sorry. No, it's not your fault, Connor. It's Ben's fault. (laughs) It is it's Ben's not, fault. It's not my fault. <laughs> yeah, you made him kill a you made him kill a dog. Fault. <laughs> so Connor, I want to know because this is like episodic. So obviously Santa's little helper is going to come back, right? How is he going to come back? Well, if it's the list of names that Wes gave in the beginning, those no, are the are, these people are who died and stay dead. They can get another dog and name it oh, no. Santa's little or helper. <laughs> I swear oh, that no. Santa's Little Helper did die and they have a Santa's Little Helper too. Or maybe I'm thinking of Snowball. It's Snowball. Okay, that that's where I was getting confused then. A universal truth that it, killing cats is okay when they're animated, but dogs is not. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's where my heart's at right now, yeah. <laughs> All right, we're going to move on to question two because I'm mad at Ben for... <laughs> <laughs> so am I. I've drank so much alcohol and I'm just like even the thought. I made it a point. Initially, I was like, oh, he's going to have to kill Patty and Selma's iguana, Jub Jub. But I was like, you can't kill an animal. <laughs> Leave it to no, Ben. No, Ben's a maniacal, yeah. awful We've discovered awful throughout man. this podcast that Ben is a psychopath. A good one. Question, a good one. <laughs> one of, he's one of the good ones. Yeah, <laughs> All right. So we're going to do a tiny bit of self-serving for a moment. Using only the movies that we've covered thus far on our podcast, you're going to choose three movies to base three segments of a Treehouse of Horror episode around. So for those that aren't aware, uh, The Simpsons every Halloween does a episode called The Treehouse of Horror, where it's basically like a a skit show where they mock some movie or or story and, and make a shorter episode. So uh, what I want from you for those three movies is to include the title of the segment and a brief one to two sentence synopsis of what would happen. So, Connor, we're going to start with you. All right. Two things before getting started. Homer's dough in the script is written as annoyed grunt. Usually that's important to know. And I'm going to throw it back to the older episodes of Treehouse of Horror and do a slight wraparound segment. So before anything gets started, The Simpsons buy a smart TV and discover there's an app already installed on it, and it's a streaming service where all the movies are starring them. And so the first one is Star Annoyed Grunt ST, or if you say it out loud, Star Dosed. (laughs) When Lisa begins writing her first ever fantasy novel, she accidentally writes a real ancient spell, 
And this causes her characters to come to life and begin to take over the lives of her friends and family. The main wizard of her piece will be who eventually Homer transforms into, and he'll be voiced by Neil Gaiman. The second one is Mr. Flandorium's Wonder Leftorium. (laughs) Ned Flanders' store, the Leftorium, which he does have in the show, begins to gain sentience and come to life out of some type of vague magic. And while it seems fun at first, Ned realizes he has to stop it when it develops not only a taste for violence, but also a taste for atheism. (laughs) and last but not least it rounds out with bratatouille bart discovers that with homer's three little hairs he can make him do whatever he wants like take (laughs) revenge on his teachers that is fucking genius (laughs) matt i kind of know what you feel like when you're battling when you know you've lost before you already go (laughs) yeah i gotta say ben that is a uh... shit you got a mountain to climb right now. It proves I watched too much of the dang show. <laughs> I know. Writing writing all these Simpsons questions for Connor, it was like signing my own death certificate. I was like, shit. <laughs> yeah, for real. Like, honestly, oh, it feels awesome, like you're attacking man. the Death Star, but realistic, where you like, you know, you're going to lose. <laughs> yeah. I think that's exactly what we were looking for with that question. So what you got, Ben? Yeah, we'll just throw yeah, it to Ben. Right? <laughs> Jesus. Show me what you got. One overlap. So I'll start with that one first. So I've got Hans Mole Man's Whimsy Boutique. <laughs> and what happens is Bart must go work in Mr. Mole Man's Boutique after breaking a pricey item. The store comes to life near the end of Bart's shift to take revenge on him for breaking something. So it's kind of the store fighting back against Bart. Uh, my second segment is Knocked Apu. <laughs> and uh, in this one, Apu has been shirking his responsibilities around his house. So his wife wishes that Apu would experience what it's like to give birth to octuplets. So it's a little bit of junior mixed with knocked up um, to kind of teach him a lesson. And then the last one is mountain haze. As a haze settles over the town of Springfield, trapping the residents in the local supermarket, they must deal with Ned Flanders calling at the end of days and also deal with whatever's coming for them. The twist is that it's just Rod and Todd out in the haze and Ned is trying to spook them all into becoming Christians and accepting, <laughs> like denying their wicked ways. <laughs> Who are Flanders' sons? Who are Flanders' right? sons, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay. Those are good, though. That's, Thank you. That's, that's a really fun question. So on to question three, then. There is a wide, wide world of characters in the Simpsons universe getting to be around 4,000 from when I did a quick Google search. So, yeah, like the Wikipedia list of Simpsons characters was like, 3,500 from a couple years ago. So I didn't check or count, but I'm guessing it's it's got to be getting up there. But you know me. I want more. So <laughs> I need you to create a new character that will become a regular in Springfield. Tell us about them and why they would be an addition to the larger cast. And Ben, you get to start again. Okay, so who's that moving to Springfield? Why, it's the freaking vegan. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god so my character's name is elmer and he's voiced by chris evans and he'll play cletus's best friend from college who moves to springfield now by college i of course mean university of phoenix online where <laughs> cletus and elmer got their degrees in animal husbandry thinking it would allow them to marry anything they wanted elmer moves to town and reveals himself to be a founding member of z which will be a play on QAnon. As he gets acclimated to the town, he realizes that there aren't enough people who know the truth in town like he does. So he decides to run for mayor of the city in an effort to educate and free the people. This will lead to him being elected mayor when his get out the vote campaign is able to bring out the vote from Cletus's family, which it turns out is 51% of the population of Springfield. (laughs) This will lead to a future episode where Elmer is shown to make changes to the city in an effort to make it a more conservative safe haven. The Simpsons could use a character skewering this type of person within America, their ability to rise to power, and the negative effect that power can have. Having him voiced by an uber Democrat like Evans is just the icing on the cake. That's very good. Can I ask who Cletus is in the show? Cletus is the slack jawed yokel, the one that tries to throw the possum in the lake, but he Mm. can't. He just can't. This is my time to shine. Tic tac toe by a chicken. Okay, got it. So he's he's like the major hick. 
Yeah, he's the hillbilly. Also, can I just ask where the name Elmer came from? I love it. I did a search of what's the most stereotypically Republican name, and Elmer was one of the ones that was on there. So I was like, yeah, oh Elmer's God. good. <laughs> I'm so glad I asked. <laughs> oh, I can never buy that glue again. <laughs> All right, Connor, uh, let's hear about the character that you would add to Springfield. All right, my character's name is Ellen Pearson, and she is an exuberant sports-loving woman who ends up dating and eventually marrying Marge's sister, Patty, and also becomes Bart's new teacher after Mrs. Kerbopple's canonical death. Everyone in Springfield always enjoys her presence, but that's because they never catch her sneaking off into the shadows, relaying information to someone. She and Homer particularly hit it off, and they go on multiple outings together that always seem to end in mysterious accidents. And as the episodes go on, we find out Ellen Pearson is a hit woman hired by Frank Grimes Jr., son of Homer's enemy, who died in that infamous episode. (laughs) I think adding a character with an overarching plot line would be interesting for the show because it wouldn't have to serialize the show, but she would be a serialized character with her own storyline going on. Patty having a wife would add a good ripple to Patty and Selma's relationship. And when Bart finds out that his teacher has a vendetta against his dad, that could be some fun team ups. There could be some interesting plot lines there. Hilarity ensues. Exactly. (laughs) Connor, you really should go and write for TV. (laughs) I'm just going to throw that out there. (laughs) Anyone listening that can make this happen, Connor and Ben, you two should go off and write for TV sometime. Connor, I'll cut up your answer to number two into a clip that you can just email to all of the Simpsons writers. And <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, I don't have a script, but I have some right. thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> As expected, between our resident champion and and returning phenomenal competitor, Connor, this was a close one. So we're, we're just going to start from the top at question one, which was, how are you going to kill off your opponent's choice for character and canonically kill them off of the Simpsons? Superintendent Chalmers for Ben. Uh, I liked the story, the walkthrough, the sting at the end of him being replaced by a Nintendo 64 because Super Nintendo Chalmers is a very funny canonical joke in the show. Oh, shit. I thought you made that up. <laughs> no, I could tell by the way that Emily was impressed by it that she didn't know that, but it, yeah, I still thought it was good. <laughs> Thank you for not letting me know. <laughs> it, it felt very Simpsons. Connor, boy, howdy. You got handed a black ball there of <laughs> no chance. And unfortunately, defense wins championships. So Ben gets question one. That's completely understandable. Yeah, I think you did as good as you could have with what you had, but... Right. Just an evil cho- a evil opponent's choice from Ben. Yeah. Sneaky, well sneaky. Done. On to question two, which, again, I am so delighted at, at... We've had a couple of questions throughout this podcast that I'm like, this question is just beautiful. And I, I think it's only beautiful because of how perfectly you, you both answered this. Connor, I love the idea of having a route to all three of them, a connecting tissue of that being on a streaming service. Uh, All of the titles were fantastic. Star Doe, Mr. Flandorium's Wonder Leftorium, because if anybody doesn't know, Flanders actually does canonically in the series own a store in a mall called the Leftorium because he sells all left-handed things like left-handed scissors and left-handed pens and pencils, I think is a thing. There's all kinds of different things. And then, and then Bratatouille. Or Ben, yours were also very good. Hans Molman in the in the Whimsy Boutique, Knocked Up Who. <laughs> if you say it at the right tempo, it's very good. Um, and then <laughs> and then Mountain Haze. I think the thing Ratatouille was so brilliant, and I can absolutely see that being something where somebody's controlling Homer with that little wispy M wire. But the <laughs> one that got me was that. The thing in in Flanders store developed a taste for violence and atheism. Um, I think you probably <laughs> won it just on that alone for me. So that question two is going to going to Connor. Thank you. Very good. Question three was definitely the closest. And what's really exciting is I didn't tell Matt and Emily who 
I chose because they came down on different sides of this. So Ben, I think that having a voice actor already picked out in Chris Evans is a very smart choice. It really helped visualize the the character even more. I think it's very current. And I think that something the Simpsons doesn't necessarily like they deal with politics. They have a mayor, they deal with corruption, that kind of stuff, but it's never really so current and such a big movement that bringing in a, a Z unk population and then just the fact that Cletus probably does have 51% of the female or the Springfield population, I thought was very funny. Connor, Ellen Pearson, you really did a good job at weaving her, her character into a lot of different other characters and potentially B C plots in lots of other different narratives where the Elmer plot would probably only come up at least as a huge part. It's going to be like a big bang and then maybe just like kind of peppered in like Mayor Quimby every now and then. And then Connor with having it be a nod to Frank Grimes Jr. calling that revenge. Like, I, I think that this was like, again, very super close. And, and what it came down to, I think, is is the inclusion of somebody who's going to be a new staple in Springfield. So that one's going to go to Connor just because I think it's slightly more included in the world versus a very good probably would be a good one-off character and maybe could easily not come back again very tough one though very tough one congratulations connor thank Thank you yeah (laughs) the elmer that like that would at least be a very killer episode i think yeah (laughs) yeah i i tried to combat that because i had the same critique of it myself that's why i tried to combat it by saying in future episodes like this is how he would change the city and I hope that that would be enough to be like he's recurring enough that th- you're going to see changes in Springfield mm-hmm. that are going to make it a little more serialized in this way. But mm-hmm. I didn't ha- I didn't hammer it enough. No, I liked that. It's just the way Connor wove everything together so nicely. It was just a writer's dream how yep, nicely totally. it fit in. <laughs> yeah, I think Con- the way that Connor made it be more part of the series instead of just the show is that he told us exactly who else it would influence. And I think that you're saying that the changing the politics, like, yeah, that's that's probably going to hit things. But again, politics isn't necessarily something historically in The Simpsons that has really had too much weight on on the plot. Imagine a Fox cartoon going hard. <laughs> yeah, imagine if that's a good point too. Fox is not going to make a Z unk character. No, Fox News and Fox the TV are two two completely different, unrelated entities. Like they're owned by the same thing, though. I don't think they not are anymore. anymore. Oh, really? Yeah, Fox News is still owned by Murdoch, but now Disney has Fox TV. Yeah, Fox TV is owned by Wolves. Well fought between both of you guys yeah, and thank extremely you. close. Thank you. Congratulations, Connor. A round thank of applause. Thank you very much. Yeah. Woo! I think we hinted at the beginning of the episode we had some rewards because me and Ben just both hit 10. Yeah, so I would like to know, Matt. Yeah. For your first, your first hitting of 10, what do you want? I want... Pulling a mat is now a good thing. <laughs> so when people say I pull the mat, that doesn't mean that they came unprepared <laughs> or they didn't have a drink ready. Um, and if they do say that, that means they have to do five push-ups, And that's my reward. So, OK, I don't yeah. think I've ever said it. So I literally said it before we started recording this today. I, so. uh, yeah. What about you, Ben? Well, my reward is I hate that. <laughs> and um mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. if you ever try to use pulling a mat in a positive way you owe 10 push-ups <laughs> no, no 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 it's had to be the same amount of push-ups no That's it's bullshit. more push-ups because it's more no. egregious no i'm changing mine to 10 push-ups then <laughs> no you said five and you went first i went second no. i said 10 we discussed it beforehand we both said five <laughs> good lord all right we'll have to talk about this off air but uh pulling no, a it's mat been decided will- it's canonical. Now be something it's in the, it's in the episode. Nobody says ever again. <laughs> I like the way that Matt's framing this. Like he's not saying this is something for us within our group of people. It it sounds like he's announcing it to the world. <laughs> yeah. 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 If anyone in the world ever says pull a mat in a bad negative sense, then they have to do five You'll push-ups. be served a cease and desist letter that says five push-ups are required. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you, you can, can get- release a book that I drink your workout routine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> I want to thank you again for being on, Connor. Do you uh, want to plug your podcast or anything else you're working on? Absolutely. So no highway option. Uh, You can follow us anywhere at no highway pod. 
this week. It comes out today. We're actually doing the movie that Ben gave us with our guest Mike King. It's Surf Ninjas. It's very interesting. And our Happy Gilmore episode with Ben came out last week. And that's a very fun time. Mm-hmm. And if you want to follow me personally on Twitter, Instagram, whatever, it's at Corndair, C-O-R-N-D-A-I-R. And I think project wise, that's all I got going on. Awesome. Very nice. Well, and thank you again for having me on. Yes, Anytime. We love having you on. Yeah. Thank you for crushing it and uh, taking Ben down a peg or two. And <laughs> yeah. for everybody still listening, thank you so much for supporting us. Go ahead and be sure to subscribe, rate and share and uh, go ahead and follow us on social media. And those tags should be in the bio. Uh, IDYP underscore podcast. And uh, next week, Ben, what do we have on deck? So next week, we are watching the movie Fracture, which features Ryan Gosling and Anthony Hopkins. It's a courtroom drama. And we're going to be joined by Lori Ann from the podcast, All the Classics I've Never Seen. So we're very excited to have her on next week. Very nice. In her podcast, she ta- she watches movies she's never seen before and talks about them. So I don't know if she's seen Fracture or not. Uh, <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> Also, next week is the finals of our Battle of Twits tournament. So it's going to be Emily versus myself. You're going down. To crown ben. a beginning of the year champion. Ooh. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, Emily. I may, uh, I may have to up my game a little bit after Connor took me down a peg. You might get, you might get full on Ben. <laughs> I didn't like the sound of that. <laughs> Thanks we for can't listening, just everybody. Full on Ben slide by. <laughs> okay, bye. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Thanks Connor. Connor. Thank you.